Good afternoon YouTube, I'm Chucky2009 and tonight we're going to be talking about different ways to cut metal. Now I know this sounds like a very simple subject but rest assured it is not. We've got several different types of material here. We got some flat stock and different thicknesses. We got some smaller pipes, some solid round stocks, some larger 2 inch schedule 80 mild steel pipe, several different sizes of square and rectangular tube, plus some uh, aluminum some 3 quarter inch mild steel plate and plenty of eighth inch and in this case 3 sixteenths mild steel plate as well. Now these are some of the various types of tools that I'd like to talk about in this video. Uh, we've got the metal cutting circular saw, we got the chop saw, portable band saw, sawzall plasma cutter, and angle grinder with a cutoff disc in no particular order. I think the first thing that I want to talk about here is the portable bandsaw. Now this particular model is a uh, Milwaukee electric portable bandsaw. I've had the thing for about two years now. It's been absolutely flawless. And uh, one of the cool things that I like about this particular model is it, is it features this rubber armor on the outside of the saw. So that way, you know, if this thing gets dropped or shoved off a table or anything along those lines, you've got that added layer of protection there, which I think is really nice. Also, the blades for saws like this are very cheap and they last for a considerable length of time. Now, you can really cheap out and get super cheap blades, but I don't recommend that because you can get brand name Milwaukee Electric Blades or Lennox Blades or Starrett Blades or one of the good names relatively inexpensively. And honestly, I think they're cheaper in the long run because they do last quite a bit longer, at least in my experience. Now, even if you're a little bit out of practice with uh, with changing blades, you've never done it before, it's, it's really easy. You can usually do it inside of a minute or two. Essentially, all you do is release the, uh, the tension lever on the front of the saw, and then the blade just kind of flops out the back. You just slide a new one on there. You just run it through those guide wheels, and you're good to go. Another advantage to this uh, type of saw is you can get all sorts of different blades for these things. I, I want to say this one is about an 18 TPI blade, but don't quote me on that. I've seen them from uh, you know 14 TPI all the way up into like the 20s and 30s for really fine tooth applications. And as you just saw, they are really quick and really easy to switch back and forth. Also worth mentioning is that some of the higher end models of portable bandsaw like this one are variable speeds. Now I generally just uh, leave this thing on 4 out of 4 which is about as fast as it'll go and this uh, also has that little LED light there which can be uh, really handy if you're trying to follow a line with it. And portable bandsaws make quick work of just about everything. There's some things that this saw isn't particularly good at that we'll talk about, but this is some about inch and a half by inch and a half square tube and it's eating this stuff for breakfast. They can be uh, very fast if you get a little bit of practice, you pay attention to what you're doing, they can be pretty accurate. However, I will say it can be kind of difficult to cut on something like a piece of square tube like that because you have to uh, make sure the blade is where you want it on one side of the tube and also on the opposite side of the tube. But flat stock like this, super easy. It just uh, pretty much slices right through this. This is just 3 8 mild steel flat stock. Bites right in and, uh, and we're off to town. And this is not a brand new blade, by the way. This thing has seen some cuts and, uh, and spent some time cutting. I'm, I was going to say hours, but I don't know if I'd take it that far. But as you can see, it's, uh, this really doesn't slow it down much at all. Now one downside to this saw is it's limited in depth. This saw can cut deeper than most other portable band saws, but as you can see it's still limited and once you bottom out like that there's just really not a whole lot that you can do. However, on the flip side it will make pretty easy work of some substantially thick material. This is some 3 quarter inch plate and it's just, it's cutting a little bit slower, but it's still definitely cutting it. And um, and so, you know, you can definitely take a bite out of some thicker plate here and there if you need to do that. Now, one other slight downside to this type of saw is they can be hard to guide through pipe like this. This is some of that two inch schedule 80 steel pipe. It'll cut it. There is no doubt about that. It'll cut this very quickly and very easily. However, it can be a real trick to get something like this lined up so you're cutting halfway close to square. That's something that I've had issues with. There's probably a secret to it, but I haven't figured it out yet. However, another pro to this type of saw is I've seen people that make uh, actual mounts for them, so they're like a stationary band saw, and that can really help with the accuracy and the ease of use, but that's an avenue that I have yet to, uh, to walk down, so to speak. And yeah, as you can see, you can definitely cut pipe like that, but I have been using this thing for two years, and I have yet to figure out how to... Uh, 
do it remotely close to square. However, you know, the cool thing about these saws is except for deep cuts and material, you can pretty much do anything. You know, smaller round stock like this piece of approximately one inch round stock here is really no trouble whatsoever. And you can cut, you can cut really, really close if you get a little bit of practice and if you know what you're doing, but honestly, that was not difficult in any way, shape, or form. Another advantage to this type of saw is it will easily cut different types of materials. This is some aluminum, and this is just some uh, about inch and a half flat stock. It's 60-61, if I remember correctly, and it eats this stuff for breakfast, no doubt about that. However, uh, the downside to using a saw like this on aluminum is that the blades do tend to get crapped up with aluminum. So if you're going to be doing any real amount of aluminum, it might be beneficial to get a um, you know a more aggressive pitch of blade. So you've got you know a fewer quantity of larger teeth or maybe something variable TPI. But if you just use a blade like this, it will get gummed up pretty quickly. However, with all that being said, I have found that these are extremely versatile. Um, very, very easy to use tools, and it's definitely not something that I would want to be without. And, you know, it's really saved my butt on a couple projects when my chop saw wasn't around or needed another blade or something. You know, you can just bust out your portable bandsaw and make quick work of just about anything. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the good old angle grinder primarily because these are very commonly used for cutting metal because well <laughs> if you're going to be into welding or metalworking you really do need to get one of these anyway sooner or later because obviously if you're going to be welding this is something that you'll use to bevel material and chamfer material maybe smooth down welds in some applications remove frost paint things along those lines they're also very cheap to buy this is a Milwaukee electric brand angle grinder obviously um, in my opinion, this is a very good angle grinder and you can find these for under a hundred bucks and that's like a third the cost of the portable bandsaw we, uh, we just discussed. They're also extremely portable and I have used a wide variety of angle grinders and people ask me all the time which ones I prefer and I will give you my three cents or two cents, yeah, two cents on these three different brands of angle grinders. I have found that the DeWalt's are very good grinders. They've got a lot of power to them. However, they get hot, they rattle, they vibrate a lot, and I don't think they're really made as well as that Milwaukee there. The Makitas are exceptionally smooth and nice to use. However, they do have the smallest motors of these three grinders here. And uh, so I really like the Milwaukee's. Uh, you really have to pay attention to these things because obviously we just gave this partial wheel a slight tap that would simulate probably not even falling off that bench onto the floor and as you can see it's now fractured like this and if I were to spin this up at 11,000 RPMs or whatever there's a very good chance that this could fly apart and um, and that would be really bad. Every single welding shop related injury I've ever had has been angle grinder related. I've, I've had metal in the eye a couple times uh, and, th and that's a pretty common thing from talking to a lot of people. Nobody really thinks that much about using an angle grinder, but these things can be extremely dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and you're not wearing the right gear. So for that reason, I always wear safety glasses with these things and I also wear a face shield now. I know I haven't done this always, but I recently have. I would never go back to not having that level of protection now. I know in some shops, not wearing two layers of eye protection when you're running an angle grinder is a fireable offense. I do know that's also not very common, but it's still a good idea because you can get sparks that go around your safety glasses. That's what happened to me. And, uh, and the face shield will also work to protect you from fragmenting discs or pieces that you're grinding on coming loose if, if that should happen to you. And then ear protection, these things are loud. I know there's a lot of people that, that use them without ear protection. You're like, oh, they don't bother me or whatever. But, you know, whatever. They are scientifically proven to be loud enough to damage your hearing. So, you know, I'm not here to save you guys from yourself, but I definitely would encourage the use of hearing protection when you're running an angle grinder. And also a face mask like this, or I'm sorry, a dust mask. This is a nice small one. It's a 3M brand that fits underneath your face shield or your welding helmet if you're welding on something that's producing a lot of smoke. And, uh, and this will protect you from the fiberglass material that holds most of these discs together. That obviously also gets launched into the air. And, um, you know, and then that goes into your lungs too. And the earplugs as well. These are the Howard Light Max Lights. I really like them. They're really cheap. I think they work really well. And uh, something else to keep in mind is that you really can't cut aluminum with a cutoff disc 
well. I, I'm told there's like some special cutoff wheels out there that, that can, but I've never used one. Your average cutoff wheel, however, if you try to cut aluminum with it, the aluminum will gunk up the cutoff wheel and then it'll throw it off balance and it vibrates and they're known to explode. So that's something else that you'll want to, uh, to be careful of. Also worth mentioning is that these things throw sparks everywhere which is potentially a good thing if you're like in high school and you want some cool Facebook profile pictures or whatever however it's a bad thing because you're launching sparks all over the place so you'll want to pay attention to make sure you're not gonna you know accidentally light anything on fire now all that being said they are extremely useful cutting tools if you respect them and you follow some really basic safety precautions this is that same piece of 3 8 flat stock and we're making relatively easy work of it it's not that easy, but you know, for a hundred bucks on a tool that you'll have to buy sooner or later anyway, it's not that bad. Also worth mentioning is you can kind of score things with an angle grinder like this and then snap them off like what I'm doing to this 3 16 plate here. I'll cut this like two thirds of the way through and then I could bend it or I can break it just like that. And that's a uh, one way to cut thicker material like that that makes it suck a little bit less. And I feel like it's an underused application for these grinders. Now, they are limited in several ways. For instance, here you can see the depth of cut is not very great and it gets smaller the more you use these wheels. And good wheels are expensive and they still go pretty quickly. Additionally, you really can't cut anything you see here. Uh, some of the smaller round stock would probably be doable with, you know, like a full-sized wheel that hasn't been used and worn down yet. However, cutting thicker plate, really anything over 3 16ths of an inch, you might as well forget about. I mean, you can do it. It's just going to be a very bad time and take forever and eat a million discs and not be very clean or very pretty. Cutting any kind of pipe is not really doable unless you want to, like, guide yourself all the way around the pipe, which, you know, it's it's not really the tool for either of those things. And additionally, if you're going to cut a piece of round stock like this, you have to mark it off on every single side and then cut every single side individually, which takes time and it can lead to things not being quite as precise as we might like them to be. So that's something else to keep in mind. However, I feel like you can definitely do a lot with an angle grinder and a cutoff wheel. As my regular viewers know, I've got a shop full of cutting equipment. I use this thing fairly regularly and uh, not all that common, but I definitely wouldn't want to be without it. Now the next thing I want to talk about is the good old Sawzall. Now this is an actual Sawzall. If it's not a Milwaukee, it's not a Sawzall. It's just a reciprocating saw, as they say. But uh, this is another very versatile tool. It's more used for tearing stuff apart than building stuff, but it's definitely got its applications. Now this is just some 2 inch by, I believe 5 inch, it's a weird size. Aluminum rectangular tubing, it's just that same 60-61 stuff I believe. And the Sawzall is eating this stuff for breakfast which is great. However, there are some downfalls to using a saw like this. Now I think most people would recognize these type of saws from, you know, home improvement type shows where they're usually used for gutting houses and, and applications that might not be the most precise thing in the world. Now, something else to keep in mind with these things is they can be kind of hard to guide on two-sided shapes like this. You know, you kind of have to peek over the top of the blade to see where you are. And, you know, if you're paying attention to the side that's facing you, you know, the blade might be angled so it's cutting the opposite side at a different angle, which can sort of be a pain. However, with a little bit of practice, you can get cuts that are respectably close. I used to use these things constantly when I was uh, in my scrap metal days before I started welding, so I, I like to think I kind of have a feel for running them. And if you have a little bit of practice and you take your time, you can do reasonably well with a lot of things. They do kind of just by nature vibrate you like no other. However, therefore, cutting thick material like this isn't the most fun thing ever. And although we just ate a piece of, I believe, one inch pipe for breakfast, you know, if that was solid one inch round stock, that could take quite some time and, and really wear down your blade. So they're not the best for cutting everything. However, for some things, they're pretty unbeatable and their versatility and their portability is, um, is pretty much unmatched. Now, something else to keep in mind is that they, you know, they can be a little bit hard to guide sometimes, like we talked about, especially on larger round stock like that. But again, with a little bit of practice, they're really not that bad. And if you have one anyway, you can really put it to good work, uh, you know, in a welding type environment. 
And the next thing we're going to be talking about is probably the most fun to operate tool in this video and that is the glorious plasma cutter. Now today we're going to be using this Power Max 45 from our good friends at Hypertherm and what a plasma cutter does essentially is it creates a stream of super hot as in like 20 plus thousand degrees Fahrenheit electrically charged plasma it's basically like a combination of, uh, of a solid and, and a liquid and a gas all in one it's the fourth state of matter and the cool thing about this is you can cut basically anything that conducts electricity and uh, another cool thing about plasma cutters is that they're very easy to use and also they're so cheap to run. This is without a doubt the cheapest to operate tool in this entire video. You got those two little pieces of copper there and that's called the uh, the consumables for the plasma cutter. You just unscrew that round part off the torch and then a few things fall out. You just pop those new consumables in there and it's ready to cut again. And they're also extremely easy to use. All I'm going to do is flip that little yellow safety up. I'm going to pull this trigger and just like that we are cutting and like I said we can cut anything that conducts electricity. Uh, this is very fast. It's There's really not much of a learning curve here you know. This was the first plasma cutter I ever bought and, uh, and I got it and within 24 hours of having it I was pretty confident in my plasma cutting abilities. It's also non-directional which is cool so you can easily cut holes in things you know like round holes hopefully a little bit more round than the one I just cut. Uh, you know you can start on the inside of a piece of plate just by penetrating through it uh, with the arc you know you don't have to start on an edge which is nice and not only that for you know cutting odd irregular shapes you can also use a straight edge like what we have here and one of the other cool things about the hypertherm units is not only is their consumable life to my knowledge the best in the industry and therefore they're even cheaper to run than a usual plasma cutter and they're American made and you can drag the, the end of that torch the nozzle there along a piece of material some cheaper plasma cutters you know when you try and do that the uh, the tip arcs to the material and it sticks and there's wire goofy standoff guides but with this you know you just rest that nozzle on there and you just guide it along a straight edge and it's really really easy to make long straight cuts uh, basically just just like that there's really not a whole lot else to it like I said they're extremely cheap to run uh, they're really easy to use not only that you can use them to cut expanded metal which is you can imagine you know cutting metal mesh with like an angle grinder or a sawzall or something might not be the most fun thing ever but these are really simple to use and they uh, they can do a lot of things well including cutting aluminum now this is one of my favorite features of plasma cutting technology you know aluminum obviously conducts electricity it conducts it very well so we can just slice through it with minimal effort now there are some other advantages to using a plasma cutter over other thermal cutting methods for instance like an oxy fuel torch here I've got some stacked material which you can cut with a plasma cutter and there's a gap in it which still isn't a problem for this awesome machine you know we're slicing through 3 8 flat stock then there's a 3 16 gap and then we're slicing through more 3 16 flat stock and it's it's not an issue in any way shape or form you can also cut through large and small round objects with this very easily as long as you give yourself a nice line and you do your best to follow it now there are some downsides to the plasma cutting process of course you know compared to some of the other things we talked about for instance if you're gonna cut something like this piece of square tube here some rectangular tube or channel or whatever and pretty much every case you'll have to cut individual sides individually but you know since the plasma torch is so light and so easy to maneuver and you can see what you're doing and you, you can easily position that arc exactly where it needs to go it's really not that hard but I still think it's something to be aware of and um, you know the other thing is this is my choice method for making long straight cuts on plate and sheet metal and things along those lines it's this is pretty unbeatable here you know I've, I've got this set up with a straight edge we're getting an extremely straight cut here and it's cutting about as fast as I can guide it and that's on some eighth inch sheet metal on a project I did a few weeks ago you know just plain works really well it's a really versatile process and since this torch is so small and compact you can use it for other jobs like here I'm about to cut a bolt hole through this fender to attach this toolbox to my tractor you know I can't reach in here with a drill or anything along those lines but I can easily reach in not only with the plasma torch with the plasma torch and a camera on top of it and I can just cut the bolt hole and that's uh, that's done now there is something else you might want to be aware of with a plasma cutter or really any thermal cutting method like this and that is that 
you know, after you cut something, a little bit of the cut material kind of re-solidifies on the bottom of the plate, and you have to remove that, and what you're looking at here are a few pieces of sheet metal I cut, and you can kind of see this metallic-like substance just kind of on the bottom of these pieces of plate there, and obviously you will have to remove that if you're going to be welding this stuff or really doing about anything with it. However, it's not particularly difficult. I've been known to use a wire brush, a slag chip and hammer, like the same thing you use stick welding works really well. And there shouldn't be a lot of dross here, you know, if you're using a good quality plasma cutter, for instance, one of these hypertherm units, and you've got your amperage set close to right, which isn't difficult to set, and you got your air pressure set close to right, and, you know, they tell you when that's set. Uh, properly on the machine itself and you know if you're doing your part there really shouldn't be a whole lot of this but you know it is there so I just thought I'd mention it you know hypertherm really is in my opinion at the top of their game Next tool I want to talk about is the chop saw. Now my particular chop saw takes these carbide tipped 14 inch blades and this is, in my opinion, the best kind of chop saw. You can also get cheaper models that use those abrasive discs that kind of look like a wheel you put on a grinder or something along those lines. I used to have one of those. There's a reason why I never use the thing anymore and I just use this. You know, those blades disintegrate into fiberglass and abrasive material, much like a grinding disc, and that goes all over your shop and into your lungs and they produce clouds of smoke. They're not nearly as accurate. The blades get smaller as you use them, which is an obvious drawback. They tend to vibrate a lot and then, you know, the material pushes on the blade and then the blade flexes because it's just that soft abrasive material and then your cut ends up being off and it's it's not a good time at all however they are quite a bit cheaper and if all you can afford is one of those abrasive wheel chop saws there's nothing wrong with that that's what i got started with and i built all kinds of stuff with the thing However, now I have this and I don't miss the <laughs> the first one I had. You know, this thing works really well and some of the advantages to a good quality chop saw like this but regardless, some of the advantages to a chop saw like this, especially a carbide tipped one, but to an extent also those abrasive bladed deals, is that they are extremely accurate. You know, you can adjust that fence there back and forth as need be. This thing, and saws like it, can cut raw material about as close to perfect as you can get it without having to machine things, which is awesome. You can slice through a piece of square tube in one cut. You don't have to cut each side individually, which is another thing. Uh, they're fast. They're extremely, extremely fast compared to a lot of the other cutting methods that we've described. And, and like I said, they're easy to use. You pretty much just take your piece of material, you lay it in there, you clamp down on it with the vise, and, and you're off and running, essentially. Now, Unfortunately, there are some drawbacks to using this saw. For one, your portability is limited. Not so much because you can pick this up and like take it with you, however, it's by far the largest and heaviest tool that we've discussed in this video. And uh, so, you know, you got that going for you. And also, if you've got an abrasive bladed chop saw, you've got the various drawbacks to those that, that I briefly discussed earlier. And if you don't have one of those and you have one of these, and with the carbide blades, then your blades are extremely expensive. This is uh, a low-ish end to average blade, and it was about $90. However, they do last for quite a while, but on the flip side, they are easy to destroy. If a piece of material, you know, comes loose and it flexes and it, and it twists and it grabs the blade, then, you know, they're, they're what, $90. If you cut something that's hardened material and you didn't know it was hardened material, they're what, $90. You know, the list goes on. However, like I said, they do last for quite some time if you take care of them. And also, they can be sharpened. I've never had one sharpened. That's something I need to look into because I got a couple of old dull ones now. But regardless, I'm told it can be done, so there's that. The other major drawback to these things is, as you can see, they are very limited size-wise in their capacities. This one will cut a piece of material that's five or six inches across, which is about as good as it gets. And actually, for a chop saw, that's a very, very respectable range of material however if you're going to be cutting like long sheets of plate or something this is definitely not the tool for the job and something else to keep in mind is you've got these chips that go everywhere they're blue so they're one step from glowing at least the steel ones the aluminum ones obviously don't discolor and, and they're hot and they land on your skin and everything for that reason 
As with everything we've talked about here, safety glasses are an absolute must. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And I generally like to wear a face shield on top of the safety glasses because they're kind of like grinder sparks. You know, they can theoretically get behind your safety glasses. And uh, on top of that, I generally wear gloves and long sleeves. Sometimes people on the internet are like, it's going to magically suck you in if you do that. I just, I'm not really holding my breath for that, but I appreciate the concern. I think the odds of that actually happening, unless you do something monumentously stupid while you're not paying attention and probably have some guards removed, are about on par with being struck by lightning. However, uh, to, to some folks that is a real concern, uh, I choose to wear some protection because of aforementioned reasons and also these chips are hot and getting burned by them. If you're not protecting yourself, it's like a 100% chance if you use the thing for any length of time. But overall, I absolutely love this thing. It's without a doubt one of the most used tools in my shop. And you can pick up a good carbide wheeled saw like this. I think new, most of them are, you know, two to six hundred dollars to give a very broad range. The carbide wheel ones, I'm sorry, the abrasive wheel ones, I think I got mine for like a hundred bucks or something lightly used. They're they're quite a bit cheaper. But like I said, if you can afford the carbide tipped ones. For general purpose applications, that's definitely what I would recommend. Now this tool definitely belongs under the, uh, the fan favorite category. This is the Milwaukee Electric 8 inch metal cutting circular saw. And this is, it functions just like a normal wood cutting circular saw. It's not a normal wood cutting circular saw. It's a lot more powerful. It's got a lot more torque behind it. Someone told me the blade spins the opposite direction and it uses a nice carbide tipped blade. However, it essentially does the same thing a circular saw does, and that is to make long straight cuts on flat material like this piece of sheet metal, and it excels at that, and it does a wonderful job of it. However, the problem is, much like with a regular circular saw, it can be a little difficult to aim this thing on a smaller piece of material like that piece of 2x2 two two square tube. That would be very difficult to accurately cut with this thing. But it does an awesome job. The blades last for quite some time, and it is extremely capable of doing the metal equivalent of everything you'd expect of a woodcutting circular saw. So I hope that this video has worked to answer some of your questions. I'll put some links in the description. And as always, have fun and stay safe, everybody.